Welcome back to the Ing Lit Hit. Today, we're going to unpack, unravel, dissect the popular interpretation of Macbeth as a mature vision of evil, as Kenneth Muir puts it in his introduction to the Arden edition of the play. Contrary to this common opinion, it could be said Macbeth's ruthless regime represents a welcome change from Duncan's weak and naive rule, and even, maybe, a force for good. We will seek to outline the questions raised in Michael Bogdanov's lecture, Readiness is All, Existential Shakespeare. Namely, is Macbeth's ruthless individualism more admirable than Duncan's weak rule and Malcolm's subsequent subservient alliance with the English? We're going to follow this plan. First, we will explore why one might assume Macbeth is a play about the antithetical struggle between good and and evil. Second, we will attempt to summarise the characters of Duncan and Malcolm in all their outward nobility but inward weakness. Third and finally, we will set out the view of Macbeth as an ambitious pragmatist as opposed to an evil demon controlled by external powers. First then, the popular interpretations of Macbeth. Many are religious and rely too heavily on this notion that Shakespeare was pandering to King James and sought merely to reflect the generally accepted dichotomy between salvation and damnation. King James argued for the divine right of kings, the idea that the monarch's authority comes directly from God. This would seem to fit with the analysis of Macbeth as a holy evil and treasonous usurper, and Malcolm, on the other hand, as the godly unifying force. He ultimately brings Scotland and England together, like King James did upon the death of Queen Elizabeth I. Malcolm's words affirm this position. He calls Macbeth devilish in Act 4, Scene 3. Macbeth colludes with supernatural forces, and perhaps more significantly, his actions cause a great upheaval in the natural hierarchy. Do you remember the conversation between Ross and the old man in Act 2, Scene 4? They report that darkness does the face of earth entomb and tis unnatural even like the deed that's done. And Duncan's horses turned wild in nature, broke their stalls, flung out, even eating each other, as Ross says. It does seem reasonable to come to the conclusion that Macbeth represents all that's evil and unnatural, while Duncan and Malcolm, with their divine right in hand, symbolise the godly and virtuous reign of, dare we say it, King James I. Both Malcolm and Duncan use natural metaphors to convey how the order of things is harmonious and fruitful under them. Think the great chain of being. Malcolm says his royal duties will be planted newly with time, which reminds us of Duncan saying he had begun to plant his veins and would labour to make them full of growing. Malcolm also reminds us that he reigns by the grace of God's grace in Act 5, Scene 1. So if you're happily nodding along, and you agree wholeheartedly with the idea that Macbeth is ultimately about the struggle between good and evil, God and Satan, heaven and hell, salvation and damnation. You're not alone. And you're not wrong either. There is an antithetical thematic framework running through the whole of the play. But it is worth taking a moment to consider the characters more deeply. Is there an analysis of Macbeth that could see him emerge as a ruthless, albeit tragic, hero that meets an unfortunate end? Is there an analysis of Malcolm that sees him emerge as a damp, cowardly squib? This seems an appropriate time to move on to our second point. Are Duncan and Malcolm, in all their apparent nobility, merely weak in reality? Well, the main events Shakespeare depicts in Macbeth can be found in Raphael Hollinshed's account of the reign of Duncan, which is now not considered historically accurate. Hollinshed presents Duncan as a weak king, soft and gentle of nature, and Macbeth as a cruel but valiant and effective ruler. Hollinshed gives greater legitimacy through his work to Macbeth's treason. Duncan names his son Prince of Cumberland, and so cuts off Macbeth's legitimate chance to succeed him on the throne. But in some ways, Duncan is presented as weak in Shakespeare's Macbeth too. Oh yes, he's honourable and full of integrity, 
but remember his words about the treacherous Thane of Cawdor? He says, There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. He's foolish, isn't he? He judges a book by its cover, and not just once. If that wasn't enough, he goes and makes exactly the same mistake again, only seconds after he's recognised his error. The dramatic irony is almost laughable when Macbeth strolls in, cool as a cucumber, and puny King Duncan showers his imminent murderer with compliments. Oh, worthiest cousin, says Duncan, my worthy Cawdor. And then later when he comments on Macbeth's castle as pleasant. Malcolm II is a picture of submissive spinelessness. In Act 4, Scene 3, he says, Before thy here approach, old Seward with ten thousand warlike men already at a point was setting forth. Ten thousand is worth a hundred thousand soldiers now. Malcolm has accepted the help of the English. And the English are doing this out of the kindness of their hearts? They don't expect anything in return? No. Malcolm has sold Scotland down the line in order to secure his throne. There is no way back from this deal. He's annexed the country to England. Then he says, My thanes and kinsmen, henceforth be earls, the first that ever Scotland in such honour named. The thanes, the war warriors and leaders of Scottish society, are to be transformed into earls, an English title for English men. Malcolm has sold off his sovereignty for a faux reign as king, with faux power and faux servants. He, it would seem, is the one who ultimately yields to a higher power. Not Macbeth, who if anything at least dies with the dignity of pursuing his hamartia, his fatal flaw, to the end. His ambition may well have been his undoing, but I suppose it sets him apart in a way too. Finally then, let's set out a different interpretation of the character of Macbeth. Remember the common Christian analysis stipulates that Macbeth represent the evil, unsaved, devilish side, and Duncan Malcolm Banquo Macduff, the godly and virtuous. But what is evil? This is the question raised by Michael Bogdanov in his lecture. Let's have a read of this. What gove could resist such an inviting Christian analysis? With such deeply entrenched conservative views as a benchmark for study, what pupil would dare challenge such authoritative assumptions? For the problem that arises with the use of the word evil is one of metaphysical subjectivity. What is evil? How do you define it? Who defines it? It is an abstract, dependent on a Christian theology that posits an opposite force in Satan and Mephistopheles. Macbeth is not ultimately a man driven to extremes by forces of darkness beyond his control. He is the ultimate existentialist. So Bogdanov's claim is that Macbeth is a character whose actions bear the mark of authenticity, namely in how his actions are driven by his ambitious personality, not by external forces beyond his control, not by this Jacobean notion of evil as all-pervading. Your job, I suppose, as critical and inquisitive Year 11s, is, like Bogdanov, to question the traditional interpretations of Macbeth, to challenge critical conventions and consider what actually makes Macbeth evil. Yes, evil, that's indisputable. But could evil, paradoxically, have been good for Scotland? Macbeth, as the ambitious pragmatist as opposed to an evil demon controlled by external powers, could hold some stock among the Scottish faithful who resent English imperial rule. It's a question of agency, the capacity to act. If Macbeth does act, isn't he to be admired? What do you think? Is there something in the portrayal of weakness both in Duncan and Malcolm's reigns that hint at a warning of sorts? Kings, beware. You need Macbeth's ruthlessness. Yes, he's a tyrannical ruler who murders children. But isn't there something you admire about him? Isn't it just a little bit disappointing when Malcolm rocks up at the end and restores order and we all leave the theatre as semi-normal human beings? Let's end with another quote from Bogdanov. Do we paradoxically admire the poetic imagination of Macbeth while celebrating his departure? Does he appeal to those latent forces that lie dormant within us all, waiting to be unleashed? Duncan? Malcolm? Macbeth? Macduff? Who would you choose? If you found this video helpful, 
please subscribe below.